Hey guys, welcome back. Well, there's a recent post on Cloudy Nights with some good detailed information about ZWO's AM5 counterweight support plate. And so I thought I'd take this opportunity to go back and take a much closer look at it than I was able to before in the previous video. Now I'm worried if the AM5N can even support the counterweight that ZWO says we can put on it. Cold Knights member on Cloudy Nights posted the information recently, and I'll be taking all that information into account, revising my structural model, and then coming up with a prediction of what that plate can hold in terms of counterweights. Can we actually go above five kilograms? And then we'll go back and take a look at that graphical presentation showed in the last video about the combinations of payload CG location and the payload weight and when to use counterweights. And finally, just how much wind will it take to turn over the telescope. I'm going to provide a simple equation that we can all use for any mount, for any payload, and just plug it in, and then you can determine what the predicted wind speed is to turn it over. Now that I see the counterweight plate design in detail, it does change my conclusions about how much weight we can use as a counterweight. We have a three millimeter thick plate, then we have a threaded hole for the M12 counterweight bar, and I'm going to assume we have nine millimeters of thread engagement. That'll be important later when we look at the strength of these threads. At at the other end, we have clearance holes for the M4 screws. They're 16 millimeters long, and so they'll screw up into a threaded hole on the mount side. And I'll assume about 6 millimeters of engagement for those threads up above. And then we have these ribs that are extremely important structurally as they're supposed to carry the load from the counterweight bar out to the four screw holes. So these ribs play a very important structural role. And yet, when you look at this particular rib, they've clearly out a little notch here intentionally this notch effectively destroys the load carrying capability of this rib causing more load to go out to the other three ribs so now we need to take a look at the structural capacity of the threads and of this plate rib structure because it all has to work together to get the load out of the counterweight bar and safely into the mount body we're talking about aluminum i assume here and one thing what property of aluminum we need is the yield stress here in this column now these are in units of KSI, 1000 PSI, is a KSI tip per square inch. And there are many alloys, even more than is in this list here. But if you look down this list, the low end is 3.5 KSI, and the high end is 70 KSI, which is very high. If we look at this on a kind of a sliding scale here, we have that 3.5 KSI down here at the low end and 70 KSI at the top. 49 newtons per millimeter squared in the SI units. Now, if we break this down, the aerospace industry is generally working up in this area because they need lightweight material and they need it to be strong. And so that kind of aluminum alloy, which would be much more costly, uh, is the kind of alloy they need for uh, aerospace applications. And then you get into structural applications where weight isn't that important, but you do need the strength. And then finally, you're down into the consumer products area where strength is not a major issue and weight is not a major issue, but they're trying to curtail costs. They don't want expensive alloys. And I'm just guessing here, but I'm, I'm assuming that that range is about 10 KSI to 30 KSI or seven newtons per millimeter squared up to 21 newtons per millimeter squared. And I'm just guessing that the AM5N is built from some alloy in this range. Although I suspect it probably is closer to this upper end. It may even go into the structural zone here. If we have a counterweight bar hanging down, the weight is pulling straight down on these threads, and you get bearing between the counterweight bar thread and the internal thread along this interface here at each step where that red line is shown. Now, what's going to happen is if the weight gets too high, we're going to develop a shear failure, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we actually fail the material, it means that we get to the state of yielding where it can start to give. And that's the failure that we're going to want to calculate and determine how much load can we put on here before we get yielding across the internal threads in our parts on the AM5 end plate. In the meridian position, we have something else going on. We have the counterweights out here. It's causing a torque being applied back into these threads. Now we get some bearing on this side of the threads at the top end, and then on the opposite side of the threads on the uh, bottom end and then essentially no contact along the middle. So there's a high contact and then it goes to zero and it goes back to high contact again. And that's the kind of thing you're expecting when you have a bending load on. But still, it's the same story. We're talking about a shear failure across the internal threads. And again, we want to calculate the corresponding load for this condition as well. Ultimately, we're going to need the shear strength for these internal threads. Now, I've never calculated the shear strength of internal threads, so I went to the Google machine and found this formula. 
what it's going to do is provide us the total shear area that is uh, resisting the load that we're placing on it. And then with the shear area, we combine that with the yield stress and we can come up with the total load. Now for the two types of threads we have in the AM5N counterweight support plate, we have the M4 threads that the four screws that plug in around the corners. We have the M12 counterweight bar. And then we have these parameters I pulled out of uh, some documentation about threads. We have the uh, pitch, one over the pitch, at 1 over 0.7 or 1 over 1.75 millimeters. This is the length of engagement, how much of the thread on the screw or the counterweight bar is actually engaged with the threads in the counterweight support plate or the mount body. And then we have some dimensions here for the uh, major diameter of the external thread and pitch diameter of the internal thread. And then finally, we can plug those numbers into the formula. And this is what we come up with for the available area that's loaded by either the screws or the counterweight. Bar. Now, on the allowable stress side, I'm going to take, at least for this table here, assume we have 10 KSI steel, or in other words, the yield stress is 3.52 newtons per millimeter squared. Now, we have to multiply that by 0.6 because we're talking about shear instead of tension, so we lose some strength capability of metals when we're talking about shear versus a direct tension or compression force. And then I've got a 1 over 2 here acting as kind of a factor of safety. In other words, ideally, you don't want the part to yield. You don't want to reach the yielding condition in a material. You'd like to stay away from that. So you put in a factor, some margin to give you a little headroom against that for uncertainties in the analysis and how the part actually is used. And in this case, I'm just throwing in one half. So if I throw all that together, I've got a, an allowable stress of 2.1 Newton per millimeter squared. And then if I multiply that by the A sub S, the shear area here, that gives me 100 Newtons per screw or 500 newtons for the M12 thread on the counterweight bar, come up with a total of 40 kilograms for the four M4 screws. Or we have a total of 50 kilograms that can be hung off of the M12 threads. Now we're only talking about a five kilogram counterweight, so it seems like a no brainer. But wait, there's more to the story. Here's the model I created last time. Now I actually have the details from that post on cloudy nights. We've got about 20 centimeters from the counterweights up to the bottom of the plate. Remember we we're talking about 25 centimeters up to the RA axis. This is about five centimeters below that. We've got 83 millimeters between these threads. And we want to look at the total strength of the M4 thread and the M12 thread for the condition where we have a home position at the equator when the counterweight bar is hanging straight down. We have 49 newtons. That's the five kilograms times the gravitational constant. And when we do that, we get all the four, all four of these screws loaded more or less equally to carry this load here. Now, when we're at the meridian, we have that same 49 newtons, but it's acting transverse to the axis of the bar and causing bending. And when it does that, these two screws up here for this force acting in that direction are the ones carrying the tension in the threads of the mount body. And then these threads here are not really loaded at all because the screws are essentially being pushed into the mount body. So the threads here are not being loaded much at all. In the home position, it's very easy to calculate the tension here. 49 newtons divided by four gives us 12 newtons. And we said we could take 100 newtons. So that's a no brainer. On the meridian, now we have 49 newtons here times the moment arm, which is this length here, and divide by two because we have two screws and divide by 83 millimeters which is the spacing between these two threads here the compression side and the tension side over here and we come up with 59 newtons all things here 59 is much larger than 12 so clearly the meridian loading case is much more important from a design perspective than the home position loading case. But once again, we're still well below 100 newtons for 10 KSI yield stress. Now the M12 thread home position, all 49 newtons are coming into the thread up here at the top. We have 500 newtons that we can carry using this fairly low strength aluminum alloy that I'm assuming here. When we're at the meridian, things get a little tougher. The same 49 times 200. Now we're multiplying it times the A sub S, that shear area time, or divided by the what's called a section modulus, we get 268 newtons, which is still less than 500 newtons. So actually these threads are in pretty good shape. Even if you went down to a yield stress of six KSI, a very weak aluminum, these threads can handle the load of the five kilogram counterweight. Now we need to take a look at the stress analysis of this plate. We've got to get the shear load out of these M12 threads here and over and up into the mount body over here. But in order to do that, you've got to have a plate that's strong enough successfully carry that load over to the M4 screws from the counterweight bar. Here's the stress analysis. What you're looking at here are the contours 
of stress. This is roughly in the 10 newton per millimeter squared. But as you get closer and closer to the hub, you can see we start moving to the reds and into the yellows. Well, the yellow is 70 newton per millimeter squared, and that's much larger even than the yield stress of high-end aerospace aluminum. It's almost certain that we're getting some yielding around this base here, even with the five kilogram weight when we're at the meridian. Here's a simplified version of that chart I presented in the last video showing of what combinations of payload and payload CG above the RA axis that require that we use the five kilogram counterweight at 25 centimeters. Now we just learned a few things about that plate that are unsettling, and that means this upper right-hand corner here is now a no-fly zone. We can't use heavier counterweights than the 5 kilogram and 25 centimeters. This is the stability limit for the ZWO tripod with the legs fully extended. And then we hit these curved lines here and up here. These, these lines correspond to the 30 newton meter torque limit of the harmonic drive motor. And we have a limit here with no counterweight, and then we have the limit up here when we are using the counterweight. And we can't use a higher counterweight that would push us up into here. And we just found out we can't use a higher counterweight because that would push us up into this red zone over here. Now, one thing I'm not showing is the 15 kilogram limit. CWO says when your payload is 15 kilograms or higher, you need to start using the counterweight. And I'm not showing that here. It's not really necessary because it's going to take care of itself. The CWO and their analysis assumed that the payload it was always at 20 centimeters above the RA axis. And when you follow that 20 centimeter offset over, it hits this 30 newton meter torque limit. Guess where? Right at 15 kilograms. So what they're essentially saying is, yeah, you can have a higher payload weight of 18, 19, 20 kilograms. But you're unlikely to be able to put that payload weight any closer than 20 centimeters from the RA axis. Let's just ignore that for now and look at three examples of how we might use this chart. I'll start off with my case with the GT81, 7.8 kilograms. I know the CG is about 21.6 centimeters above the RA axis. So I would come over to this vertical axis and put the green dot right there. And then I'm going to start moving across until I get to the weight of my uh, GT81 at 7.8, and that puts us about right here. So now that I can see that I'm inside this envelope here, now I know that I'm okay and I don't need to use a counterweight. I'm not pushing the stability limit up here, and I'm certainly not pushing on the 30 newton meter torque limit over here. In this case, I've got an 18 kilogram payload, and somehow I've managed to put it at 16 centimeters above the RA axis. So that puts us right here. I'm close to the 30 newton meter unbalanced torque limit but I'm not crossing the lines. So in this scenario, assuming I could actually put something together with a low enough CG, I could use this 18 kilogram payload and not use the counterweight if I wanted to. Now, finally, a more realistic scenario, we have a 19 kilogram payload, but it's up at 25 centimeters above the RA axis, which puts us outside this 30 newton meter torque limit with the counterweight. Now we've got to do something, and there are several options at our disposal here. One is, if we're going to be using the AM5, we better use that counterweight. And then we have two options. We can lower the payload center of gravity until it hits this line here, so at about 22.5 centimeters. The second option is to find some way to reduce the weight of our payload and kind of move this green circle out until it hits the line over here. So that's taking off about two kilograms of weight and keeping it at the same height or some combination of the two. You just want to get down to this line and that's when you can safely pair your payload with the AM5N. Now that we understand the structural limitations of that counterweight support plate, we definitely want to stay in, within the ZWO guidelines of 5 kilograms, no higher, and at 25 centimeters and no farther out. We have our telescope sitting out doing imaging, or maybe it's finished doing imaging for the night, and we put a cover on it. How much wind can we tolerate? How comfortable should we be when we leave our mount outside? Take a look at that and go through some dimensions that you can use for your own setup. It doesn't have to be the AM5N. It could be any mount you have, any payload you have. But here are the critical parameters we need in order to predict what wind load will cause the uh, scope to tip over, which is the last thing we want. First, we need the distance between the tripod legs at the ground, so that's L. Then we need the height up to the center of either the payload, uncovered payload, or the height of the cover, as we show, as I show over here. Then we have B and D, which are the width or the height of the payload, 
roughly speaking, you don't have to get too accurate with this. Just do something like I'm doing here, creating a box around it that encompasses the payload. Or we have a B and a D that captures essentially the area of the cover. And again, you may have some weird shapes with the cover and depending on what your telescope is. And so I'm leaving something out here, leaving something out here, but I've got I've got empty space here that I'm assigning to the width. So just use your judgment. You don't have to be too precise with this measurement. Now we have the area that we're talking about. This is the area that's going to be the dominant place where the wind is applying a force, but reacting against that wind and, and helping to stabilize our setup is the weight of the setup itself. And I'm talking about here is the total weight. We've got the payload, we've got the mount, we've got the tripod, and of course you may have counterweights added on to the bottom of your of your mount. Now let's go over and take a look at the equation that we can use to predict what wind speed will cause either of these setups to tip over. And keep in mind that the assumption here is that the scope is at the home position counterweights down. Here's the formula if you use inches and pounds in the calculations like I do. Another version of this formula if you work in the SI units of centimeters and kilograms. Here I'm taking all the length dimensions and measuring in inches. I'm taking my weight, total weight of the system, and that's in pounds. Or conversely, all the length dimensions are in centimeters and the weight is in kilograms. Plug your numbers into this formula. Take the square root, multiply by 106, and now you get the wind speed that would cause your setup to tip over. A couple of examples, again, using my GT81. I've got two cases here where there's no cover and two cases over here where there is a cover. I've got a case in each where I don't have a counterweight and then I have the case where I have the five kilogram counterweight and likewise over here when it's covered I've got no counterweight or I have the five kilogram counterweight. And I go through these, these are the parameters that I measure with my system and if I come down here and calculate the wind speed that can push this telescope over, it's actually a good story when it's uncovered. I have less area for the wind to act on, so I, it takes a higher speed wind to cause the telescope to tip over. And, of course, the counterweights do help. It weight raises the destabilizing wind speed from 34 miles per hour to 40 miles per hour, so that's something. And then if we put the cover on it, the wind speed required to push the telescope over is quite a bit lower here. It's actually pretty darn scary. When you don't have the counterweight and you're covered, you're down at 21 miles per hour, which is not that much. We're talking about a gust here, not a steady wind. With the five kilogram counterweight, it does help you out a bit. It raises you from 21 miles per hour to 24 miles per hour. So be careful if you have one of these AM5Ns, but this is where that low weight can come back and bite you. Well, some great information about the ZWO AM5N counterweight support plate was posted on Cloudy Nights. So that allowed me to do some legitimate analysis of the plate to find out what its capabilities are. We first took a look at the threads, the M4 threads for the screws in the corners of the support plate and the M12 thread that supports the counterweight bar. In both cases, both threads can support a higher counterweight, depending on what aluminum alloy we're talking about. And then we took a look at the ribbed three millimeter thick counterweight support plate, and that's where the wheels come off. This is actually the weak link of the design and the big limiting factor for uh, how much counterweight we can put onto the AM5N. It's highly likely that even with the five kilograms at 25 centimeters, we're getting some local yielding of the aluminum around that that hub. In light of that information, I updated the payload and counterweight combination chart, kind of a graphical summary of ZWO specifications, and deleted the options for using more counterweights for heavier payloads due to that low strength of that plate. Then I provided a pretty simple formula that allows us to calculate the wind gust speed to tip our setup over. And it turns out if you're using a cover, of course, with a higher area, you're much higher at risk with a lighter weight mount like the AM5 of having that thing tip over. So if you're leaving your AM5 in outside during the day waiting for the next night, I would consider doing something to tie down the legs or to weight down the legs to increase the resistance to overturning. It just takes a relatively small wind gust to knock that system over. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm convinced I'm going to stick with the ZWO recommendation for a five kilogram counterweight at 25 centimeters and not exceed either one of those numbers. Okay, guys. Well, that's all I have for today. Clear skies, but watch out for that wind. See ya.